Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Campbell giving another webinar. This time, we're going to take a look at hormones and which hormones are affected most and how. So let's get started. In the beginning, as we always, I always teach in all medicine, the first thing to do is detect the cause. Somebody comes into the doctor, I have headaches. I can't sleep well. I have aches and pains in my joints or, and muscles. First, find out why. Don't immediately order a bunch of lab tests and prescri prescribe medication. No, first, detect the cause. Why does th this person have Hashimoto's thyroiditis? Instead of doing a test saying, oh, you have Hashimoto's, we're going to give you X, Y, and Z. No. Why? Why do you have Hashimoto's? Then when we find out why, you remove the cause, and, and then you repair the damage, and the patient is cured. So two important points about mycotoxins. A mold that produces mycotoxins produces a series of mycotoxins, not just one mycotoxin. It's not penicillium makes this toxin. Aspergillus makes this other one. No, they produce a series, okay? So one mold, several mycotoxins. And if a mold known to produce mycotoxins is present in a home or a building, and then the mycotoxins it produces are present as well. They go together. Medical and scientific facts. Spores of toxigenic fungi contain mycotoxins. The spores, okay? Mycotoxins associated with spores are likely to be absorbed via the respiratory epithelium, the inside the respiratory tree, and translocated or moved to other sites producing systemic effects. So forget all this hoopla on Dr. Google and the internet for misleading websites that it's the liver and the bile and the gut and all that kind of business. That is not what medical science shows, okay? <clears throat> so next, more scientific facts. Oops, sorry. Um, if you, whoops, I think that's done. It is estimated that any one time 10 to 25 million workers in 800,000 to 1.2 commercial buildings in the U.S. will have symptoms typical of sick building syndrome. When did this first come out? You can read it yourself. New England Journal of Medicine, the number one most prestigious journal in in the world and published how many years ago? 30. <clears throat> so what do mycotoxins do? They're carcinogenic. They can cause cancer. They're mutagenic. They can change your DNA. They're estrogenic. They disrupt normal estrogen metabolism and they affect hormones. They can also impair the normal function of the immune and nervous system. No, they don't suppress the immune system. They dysregulate it, okay? They impair its normal function. It impairs also the normal function of kidneys and liver. And mycotoxin also, mycotoxins also interact with the gut microbiota in a detrimental way. We're going to look at all of this. So certain mycotoxins are also mycoestrogens. Their ability include binding to estrogen receptors, confusing the pituitary gland as to the actual uh, stores or amount of healthy estrogens in the body. And while an excess of estrogen is not desired, adequate stores are absolutely necessary for proper brain function, gut function, and blood sugar regulation, in addition to the obvious glandular requirements of estrogen. So, mycotoxins affect estrogen and can lead to precocious sexual development. And this means by age eight. Also, infertility, 
the development of malformations and the development of breast cancer. Mycotoxins can also cause polycystic ovary syndrome and premature ovarian function. The polycystic ovary syndrome is also known as PCOS and the premature ovarian function POF and also endometriosis, which makes it difficult to become pregnant. So what about testosterone? Chronic inflammatory response to mycotoxins upregulate an enzyme called aromatase. And this enzyme is responsible for the last step in estrogen biosynthesis from androgens, meaning testosterone, converting it to estrogen the wrong way. The endocrine disrupting potential of mycotoxins has been investigated to, to assess the interference in estradiol, testosterone, and progesterone hormone production. An increase in progesterone and a decrease in testosterone were observed. So what about T2 mycotoxins? How do they affect? We're talking taking one, but there's there's many, but we're taking one. Can lead to the decrease of testosterone secretion in primary light Leydig cells. Those are the cells that produce testosterone. And studies have demonstrated T2 toxin decrease the testosterone biosynthesis in the primary Leydig cells directly. So it's a direct effect. Penicillium toxin, this is another one. It is known as a central nervous system depressant, meaning the brain. It's a hyperglycemic agent, meaning it increases blood sugar and produces massive bone marrow depression, meaning you make less types of certain cells, red blood cells and white blood cells. It's also hepatotoxic, meaning affects the liver, and nephrotoxic, meaning it affects kidneys. What else does penicillium do? It produces inhibition of testicular spermatogenesis, meaning the formation of sperm from testicles, and steroidogenesis, but increase in adrenal steroidogenesis and ultimately sterility in males. So what about okra toxin? This is the third one. Well, it causes an impairment of spermatogenesis, the formation of sperm. Also, it's a very good biomarker in blood because in serum, because it binds so well to serum. 99.8% of okra toxin in the body is very tightly bound to albumin. So it cannot be excreted through the kidneys, okay? So when you do a urine test and you see ochratoxin, now you know why it's an unreliable test. Hashimoto's, <coughs> thyroiditis, mycotoxins, also known as autoimmune thyroiditis. Millions of people struggle with Hashimoto's which is an autoimmune thyroid disease. They eat normal amounts of food and exercise regularly, yet keep gaining weight. Their thyroid levels are difficult to adjust and to treat. This is because the cause are mycotoxins, not the thyroid. Remember what I said in the beginning, find the cause, remove the cause, repair the damage. Once the treatment for the mycotoxins is complete, the Hashimoto's goes away. What are the effects of mycotoxins on thyroid function? These patients presented in a study with normal function of thyroid or with required treatment with T4, with normal stim stimulating hormone levels, TSH, free T4 and free T3 levels in the blood but still had symptoms of hypothyroidism, mainly fatigue. Once the treatment for mycotoxins was complete, normal thyroid function returned. You now understand. So here's another one. 
the patients with a history of mycotoxin exposure experiencing chronic fatigue, cognitive disorders, what does that mean? Brain fog, short-term memory loss, sleep disturbance, etc., and different kinds of hypothyroid symptoms despite provision of levothyroxine monotherapy, Synthroid. The most important factors in thyroid hormone regulation are the activities of the three DIO dinase enzymes, DIO1, 2, and 3. And number two, especially, regulates the activities of the thyroid hormone by metabolizing T4 that is secreted by the thyroid gland into the biologically active molecule T3. So let's talk about this urine testing that I just mentioned. <clears throat> this is a study published a year ago. The variability of mycotoxin concentrations in urine based on daily intake demands urine sampling at different times during the day. So you take one in the morning, one at noon, one in the late afternoon, one at night, and do that for three days, and then send each one separately, not mixed. And then the normalization with creatinine concentration. But the problem is challenging because of, as it says, various factors such as gender, are you male, female, et cetera, age, diet, and muscle mass, can influence creatinine secretion. And of course, use of invalidated, here's what the CDC says, use of invalidated urine mycotoxin test. Okay, so it's not supposed to be used for any clinical diagnosis. Look at what they say in the same study from a year ago about the ELISA method. The ELISA method to detect to detect mycotoxins, which is the same test ELISA method is the is how my micro lab does it in human serum comes with significant accuracy, precision, and specificity. What is the most precise and accurate test for mycotoxins? I've shown this slide before. You have both IgG antibodies, which is in indicates a toxic reaction, and IgE antibodies, which is a mast cell activator for 12 different mycotoxins. That means 24 re test results, and it's available internationally all over the planet. I know that the laboratory gets serum from everywhere. Malta, Cambodia, Panama, etc. Let me explain to you antibodies. Okay, there's four pathogens, meaning microbes that cause pathology, meaning they hurt the body. Bacteria, viruses, pathogenic fungi, and parasites. We develop antibodies to these after an infection or an exposure and or exposure. And all four of them are living organisms, have cell walls, etc. Antibodies to a fungus... Like I have, I did the LabCorp or Quest test, and it showed positive for Candida aspergillus penicillium. That just means sometime in your life, you were exposed to these. Okay, that's all it means. Toxins, however, like mycotoxins, are not alive. They don't have cell walls. Toxins are molecules. Mercury is a molecule. Glyphosate is a molecule. Arsenic is a molecule. Mycotoxins are molecules. Antibodies to toxins indicate a current immune reaction, not a past one. Once the toxins are gone from the body, the antibody reaction fades away. So what does it look like? Because I've asked, been asked that by people. Can you see the difference? Here's the IgG, and here's the IgE. Okay? 
Now, I attended the A4M conference in Las Vegas in December 2023, just a few weeks ago. And this was a talk, lecture given by Dr. Vujdani, who most graciously allowed me and gave me permission to use his slides. And um, the lecture was called Understanding Immunology Lab Tests and Their Capabilities. So he said, this is the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, the ELISA test that's used by my micro lab. Now you can see all how it's done, but on the left, okay, it says creating a highly reproducible duplicate test result. So it's very duplicable. Not so many of the others. Now, also, this ELISA test is an indication of how much you have in your body. If you do Western blot, it just tells you yes or no. Are you pregnant or not? Yes or no. Those that kind of it's a it's a quant it's a qualitative. Do you have it? Do you not? So down here, dot blot is a qualitative variation of the ELISA test that uses impure or a mixture of antigens. The result can only be positive or negative. This neg cannot distinguish between positive, neg negative, and equivocal test results. How about the ELI spot test or enzyme-linked immunospot? Okay. What did this study show? As with all cellular-based assays, the final results are dependent on a number of technical variables that may impact precision, if not highly standardized between operators. So it's not a very good test to use because it depends on who's, who in the lab is reading it that day. Well, that's not good. Here's another test. Look at the bottom right, the GI map. Do you see what they did in this research article in Access Microbiology four years ago, in 20, published in 2020? Well, it says it did the test, the same test, and found if you sent it to the GI map, it was only 26% accurate. Well, not for my patients. I don't want that dust. What about the use of these famous organic acid tests for gut health? Okay, so this was looked at. And it said several popular organic tests, acid tests claim to detect imbalances in gut bacteria and fungi. But most of the microbial markers of these tests do not measure what they claim to do. So when you go to these people who do these tests, guess what? It doesn't work. It's not accurate. Here's, um, again, candida overgrowth or et cetera. Well, you know, what is the final conclusion? Urine organic acid test should not be used to accept, to assess gut health from this study. What, about, what is the good, bad, and the ugly? The laboratory methods are usually pretty good. The type of samples, though, are what matter. If you're using urine, that's bad. If you're urine, using serum, that's good. And what happens? If you're using urine, the interpretation is ugly. Chemical antibodies in blood versus chemical presence in urine. Many labs focus on levels of chemicals measured in urine, but this is an indication of chemicals that have already passed out of the body. We should measure immune response to the chemicals emphasizing the importance of neoantigen formation and chemical body burden. 
Practitioners can thus examine the roles of chemical-induced neoantigen formation in the development of autoimmunity. So, look for body burden of chemicals, for example, mycotoxin antibodies, not chemicals coming out of my urine, mycotoxin in urine. Okay. Here's something from this journal published six years ago, 2018, which are un for Lyme unsuitable diagnostic tests. Look at these. Here's the LE spot we mentioned, by the way. The lymphocyte transformation test, the PCR on serum or PCR on urine. Okay. What else? The VCS, that famous test that Dr. the Shoemaker crowd loves, which is absolutely a sham test. What about that CD57? Okay, that's also not acceptable. This study was done in conjunction with three, the Lyme experts of three countries, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Okay, so in the conclusion of understanding immune tests and their capabilities, okay, understanding the principles of the last lab testing will enable you to differentiate between the good, the bad, and the ugly. What samples should you use to get reliable results? Why the reliable reporting of test results is so important? And the correct interpretation of test results is highly, highly important. So what is best? Why years of experience in research and clinical lab work matters in interpreting results? The testing for mycotoxin antibodies via serum is 30 years old. And why, lastly, why you shouldn't go on a fishing expedition when you order a test. So folks, when you want to order a test for whatever, watch my webinars so you get accurate, specific, and sensitive tests. What about treatment for molds and mycotoxins? How do you treat this? You apply the first rule of toxicology. What is that first rule? Get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. A person's health cannot be restored if they continue to be exposed no matter what the treatment. I get inquiries constantly. Well, the patients have been treated now for three months and they're still not well. They're still being exposed somewhere. Watch my webinar with Brantley May. Brantley May goes through every type of testing of your, for your home, the pros and the cons of each one. Because let me tell you, folks, there's a lot of cons out there. First, you also should minimize environmental exposure, pesticides, VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. Pro don't eat processed foods, artificial sweeteners, artificial food flavorings, colorings, and preservatives. Watch my webinar I did on nutrition and foods. It was just last month. And of course, try to avoid EMF exposures. And are you taking a bunch of supplements you bought on, on offline, you know, somewhere on the internet? Well, a recent study showed 11% of nearly 60 of the most popular tested dietary supplements actually contain an accurate amount of the key ingredients, 11%. 40% did not contain a detectable amount of the ingredients at all, 40%. So when you buy all these things off the internet, 40% probably don't have anything that it says on the label. And this is why it's vitally important to do your homework before selecting supplements as I have done now for 35 years.
I know which ones are good and which ones are in that 40%. Treatment. An antifungal medication is essential. I use itraconazole, 100 milligrams twice a day. Melatonin, 3 milligrams. Don't ask me about long acting and 20 milligrams or 50 milligrams of melatonin, please. You have to read what the studies show, not what the internet shows, not what those opinions and anecdotes tell you. You have to go by the medical evidence. Vitamin D3, vitamin C, B complex, magnesium, and phosphatidylserine. Let's look at these. Itraconazole, which is the, the generic name, uh, Spornox is the brand name, is a common antifungal that was developed in the 1980s. It has been in clinical use for 35 years with an established safety record. This was published in 2017. Add another seven years to the 35, it's now 42 years of established safety record. But if you go to listen and want to listen to Dr. Google and all those opinions on the internet, oh, it's your your teeth are going to fall out, your eyeballs are going to you're are going to go blind, your liver is going to be destroyed, and all that. Those are just opinions. This is the medical and scientific evidence. Here's another one just so you understand it. This one is 24 years old. Itraconazole is a broad spectrum triazole antifungal agent. It has favorable pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic profiles and is available both as oral and IV formulations. Itraconazole has proven to be a valuable addition to the antifungal drugs currently available for treatment. Itraconazole has been well tolerated with doses of up to 400 milligrams per day being generally free of serious adverse effect. This is a published study. If someone on the internet tells you that's not so, tell them to show you the study. There isn't that. And here is a study on voriconazole in critically ill patients with acute on chronic liver failure, and continuous renal replacement therapy. Kidneys are failing. This was published three years ago. Four. Yeah, that's how safe it is. To clarify, fluconazole and itraconazole. Candida is a yeast. I get a lot of questions of candida. Okay, so candida is a yeast. It's a clinical, classical, opportunistic, pathogen, meaning it resides harmlessly in about 50% of all people on the planet, and it's kept in check by the immune system. If you want to get rid of it, you use fluconazole because that prevents candidiasis. And by the way, candidiasis is part of our microbiome. However, this drug has no activity against molds. You want to argue it? Here is the study. Somebody says it's, this, is, this is wrong, show me the study. This is the medical and scientific evidence published 20 years ago. Fluconazole. So fluconazole hits yeasts, it does, which are single cell molds. Multiple cell molds are like uh, um, uh, aspergillus, stachybotrys, penicillium. Well, fluconazole doesn't touch those. But itraconazole touches not only the yeasts, but all the others as well. Makes sense to take the itraconazole. So 80% of the immune system is in the gut. So treatment should begin there too. And the main com components will be diet, carefully selected supplements and probiotics, and use the spore-forming bacilli for probiotics. For diet, and I gave the lecture on this last month, so you got to see it. Try gluten-free for 90 days. Avoid dairy, sugar, and soy, and various other things. How do you support the body? Magnesium, phosphatidylserine, omega Q, Q plus max from Dr. Steve Sinatra that combines the last two. 
omega. It gives you omegas for enzyme Q10 and resveratrol and curcumin all in one. Phosphatidylserine, why? And then the and then I'll have, you know, practitioners say, well, why not choline? Well, why didn't you go read on it? In a medical journal, in medical evidence, not look it up on the internet and see what some site says. The effectiveness of oral phosphatidylserine supplementation has been studied in double-blind placebo-controlled randomized clinical trials. It enriches myelin, which coats all your nerves. It influences the metabolism of the neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Serotonin is your happy neurotransmitter. That's what prevents depression. It stimulates and enhances performance on tasks that test learning ability and short-term memory. Compared with the effects of placebo, which was ineffective, phosphatidylserine supplementation produced significant improvement in short-term recall, immediate memory, vocabulary skills, and ability to recall words, attention, and vigilance. Here it is. It was published in the journal Nutrition. Okay, melatonin. Recent studies confirm the benefit of melatonin in reducing the cellular damage generated as a result of metabolism of toxic agents, including mycotoxins. These protective effects are apparent when melatonin is given as a sole therapy or in conjunction with other potentially protective agents. Melatonin's ability to protect neurons from molecular damage due to a wide variety of substances, including mycotoxins. This was from the journal Current Neuro Neuropharmacology. Okay. Magnesium. It's the 11th most common element in the human body. It's a master mineral and necessary ingredient for, for approximately 350 enzyme systems, thus playing a role in the majority of the body's metabolic processes, okay? Up to 80% of the population are deficient in this. Magnesium binding sites have been detected on more than 3,700 human proteins that are essential for building, repairing, and maintaining your body's cells. This was published by me in Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine. Now, let's look at some more magnesium. It's a cofactor for a substance known as ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We're going into basic biology here which plays a role in energy metal metabolism, the processes by which the body breaks down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, converting them into energy. ATP is the energy currency of the cell, the primary product made by, eat, by our cells' energy factories, the, the mitochondria. And my, magnesium is required as a cofactor for vitamin C, you know, activating one of the body's most important antioxidant nutrients for support of the immune system. Magnesium is also a cofactor for many other nutrients, including zinc, potassium, vitamin B complex, calcium, and vitamin D. Without magnesium, it would be difficult to absorb and use these necessary substances. This is published in Nutrients, the journal Nutrients. Now let's look at this other publication, the same journal, Nutrients, at a different year. B vitamins compromise a group of eight water-soluble vitamins. Their collective effects are particularly prevalent to numerous aspects of brain function, including energy production. DNA and RNA synthesis and repair, genomic and non-genomic methylation. So all these people that say, oh, I tested myself for methylation, I can't, here it is. 
and the synthesis of numer numerous neurochemicals and signaling molecules. Furthermore, evidence from human research, not in rats, not in chickens, etc., clearly shows both that a significant proportion of the populations of developed countries, which is us here, suffer from deficiencies or insufficiencies in one or more of this group of vitamins. And that, in the absence of an optimal diet, administration of the entire B vitamin group, rather than a small sublet, subset at doses greatly in excess of the current governmental recommendations, would be rational approach for preserving brain health. Okay, now you've got it. Let's look at D, vitamin D3. Vitamin D supplementation can be very helpful in cognitive impairment, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and other conditions that develop due to brain cell malfunction or cell death. Low vitamin D levels are associated with increased cognitive impairment, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and respiratory diseases. This I published in Advances in Mind and Body Medicine 10 years ago. What about the sinuses? And I get a lot of questions on this. Oh, I did the Marcons. Marcons doesn't exist in medicine. It exists in the imagination of Shoemaker and his followers. There isn't a single study saying that Marcons is real. This is a real study. It was published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings, okay? Dr. Ponico, chairman of the ear, nose, and throat surgery uh, uh, section of the Mayo Clinic, published this, look at that, 24 years ago. He took 210 patients, took them to the OR, cleaned out their sinuses, 96% of them had mold growth out on plates. Treatment, intranasal amphotericin B with oral itraconazole. Okay? And they checked this with both CT scan and nasal endoscopy and showed that it worked. Don't at, forget niacin and all these other things. Forget. Here is the medical and scientific evidence. What about other treatments? So everybody's immune system is unique and different, like a fingerprint. There's no standardized treatment. It has to be individualized. There's no one size fits all. That's why these protocols don't work. That mean, A protocol means that you treat a 22-year-old female who weighs 110 pounds the same as you would treat a 55-year-old male that weighs 250 pounds. That doesn't make sense medically at all. Base your treatment on medical and scientific evidence, not on opinion, anecdotes, and internet so-called experts. Ask them, how many courses did you take in medical school? Um, what institution gave you your certificate? What medical institution? Oh, it was an online course. Well, anyone can do that. Here's something else, the prop, the, this love affair that sites have on the internet for glut, glutathione. Well, you can't use glio, glutathione if your patient has gliotoxins. Why? Because it promotes gliotoxin-induced cytotoxicity. It makes it more gliotoxin more toxic. Here we go. This study was published in the Journal of Cell Biological Toxicology. Ah, binders, the great delusion, the medical evidence, facts, and truth. Here you go about binders. What does it was what is one study which is the only one I'm, I found on the in the more than hundred million studies that are are available online at the National Library of Medicine, also known as PubMed.gov, and accessible to everybody, is that you can read here. 
They're effective in neutralizing aflatoxins, which aflatoxins are toxins that don't grow indoors. They are very ineffective in all other mycotoxins. In addition, they bind vital vitamins as well as macro and micro elements. Then I get those, well, yes, but you've got to take them several hours before or after and all this. Here's the study. Show me a study that says uh, this binder should be taken this often for and this much. This is the dose. Uh, this is the length of treatment. Or There's a single study. Sham tests, Neuroquan. This is really a for Alzheimer and brain trauma. SPECT scan of the brain is much more useful in clinical medicine. Marcons, as I mentioned before, there's no evidence in medicine to support Marcons diagnosis and treatment. It is not, rec it is not recognized by medical science. Here's this uh, HLA-DR, another one of the Shoemaker crowd tests. It's supposed to affect 25% of the population, which is 82 million Americans, okay? But there isn't a single study published saying HLA, DR, or anything with molds and mycotoxins. There's no research. It's not taught in any medical institution and has no basis, yet it's supposed to affect 20, 82 million Americans? Well, here's a disease that affects... 34 million Americans, almost 50 million less. It's called diabetes. Everybody's heard of it. This other one, the 82 million, is not in medicine. Okay. Please, this is an ERMI test, and public may be making indoor mold cleanup decisions based on some they shouldn't be using. This was published in 2013. Okay, 11 years ago now, folks, don't use that test. If you want a simple uh, preliminary test, use this. It's a kit. It's relatively inexpensive, and it's easy to use. You can, the, it, in 20 minutes, you have, res you, you, you're done with it. Then you send in, and they send you the results of the test. So I, I, I did it myself, so I know what I'm talking about. If you want any of these studies, molds, mycotoxins, the brain, the gut, and misconceptions, let me know. This one, molds, mycotoxins, and the other effects in children, Lyme disease and mycotoxins, how to differentiate between the two, and environmental triggers and autoimmunity. This was published in Autoimmune Disease. Please let me know. A week from today, we're going to be doing tea time. That's at 5 p.m. ES, 8 p.m. EST, 5 p.m. PST. I'm sorry, it doesn't show on the screen. Next Wednesday, on the 10th, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope to see you there, folks, and I hope you learned something from my lecture. Happy, happy New Year to all of you listening.